Right, so in this video, we're gonna talk about the menopause, postmenopause, and perimenopause. We're gonna talk about how the hormones can affect you and what it means to you as a woman when you're running, and what you can do to try and alleviate some of the symptoms that come with hormone changes so you can keep running to the best of your ability. <laughs> Right, okay, what I'm about to lay down is by no means a comprehensive guide, more of a TLDR. A lot of my information comes from the book Next Level by Dr. Stacey Sims. There is so much fantastic information and doing your own research is the best way to learn. As a male coach, it is my duty to understand how the female body works as a lot of my athletes are female. So even as a male athlete, it is important to understand what our female counterparts are going through. The caveat to this video is obviously I'm a 24 year old male, so I'm never gonna fully understand what you guys are going through. I'm gonna do my best to lay down the best information I can. If I've worded something badly, then sorry in advance. Anyways, as a mathematician at heart, I like to try and define things straight off the bat. What does the word menopause actually mean? The menopause is the moment in time you've been completely free from a period for a whole year. But all the hormone changes that occur before this moment for numerous periods before that, well, that's the perimenopause and they cause the postmenopausal symptoms. The advice is largely the same from all the way from peri to postmenopause. The following advice is essentially how you can help alleviate the symptoms caused by all the hormone fluctuations and imbalances. We're gonna try and reprogram the signals that are being sent to your brain to help keep you healthy and strong. There is a real stigma attached to the menopause and information can really be hard to find. Hence why I wanted to make this video. If you feel like you don't know a lot, you're in good company. A study in 2019 of 177 resident physicians in family medicine and even gynecology found that 20% of them received zero lectures on the menopause and less than 7% of them felt like they could actually help. The process of aging is inevitable and we can do jack about that. But what we can do is optimize the cars we've been dealt. Stacy says herself, 60 is not now the new 40, but there are a lot of badass 60 plus year old women smashing it still. So there is no reason why you can't do the same. So let's talk a bit of bore about what it actually is. The life expectancy for a woman in the West is about 81 years old, and the average age of being in the menopause is about 51. This means 40% of your life will be after this point. Now factor in the five to seven years of being perimenopause, and that's a very large chunk of time. That's potentially 14 years added on to my life, or like three and a half dog lives. In the time of Hippocrates, the menopause was basically considered when a woman became powerless and useless. How nice of them. Witch hunts were mainly on menopausal women because apparently they had gone mad because they were using herbs to try and lessen their symptoms. It was a recognized thing in the 1880s as a medical condition, but it was described as the death of the womb. The story goes on and on. Perception does matter. There is a direct relationship between how a woman views the menopause, her body image, and the risk of a lady suffering from depression. So having a negative attitude toward the menopause is actually gonna ramp up your levels of anxiety too. All this negative stigma that comes with the menopause may make you start to feel worthless and less inclined to do exercise. So you're not doing all the things that are gonna keep you healthy, which is gonna cause a very nasty cycle. I want you to see that there is a chance to take a step up and keep getting better every single day. About 5% of women experience early onset menopause which is between 40 and 45. So they can really start to have symptoms all the way in their early 30s. As an active woman, the transition is easier as you may suffer less from insomnia, depression, and other disruptive symptoms. However, nobody really gets through the menopause completely symptomless and it doesn't affect their performance. So let's talk more about the hormones. Let's start with the perimenopause stage. This is where you start to go from your regular 25 to 40 day cycle to one that may only last three to seven days and it can be a very inconsistent one. You may miss them, suddenly may have a very heavy, prolonged period. This can start early, but this usually happens about 45 years old. And why is that? Basically, estrogen and progesterone. During the years prior, your ovaries secrete estrogen to thicken the uterus lining, as an egg matures inside one of them. Hormones levels peak at two and four weeks. During the years leading up to the menopause, the number of eggs decline and they aren't being released like clockwork. Your body keeps ramping up estrogen to try and line your uterus, but as no egg is being released and there's no progesterone, that is gonna cause an imbalance. Estrogen is far too high and progesterone too low. The imbalance is what causes headaches, mood swings, and more. Less commonly, some ladies have low levels of both hormones. This happens more frequently when women have had light or issues missing periods. This can also happen in women who have a history of producing low amounts of estrogen and progesterone 
during their reproductive years. The fluctuations can happen for 10 years, but generally were really felt in the last four to five. It's normal to notice that hard training isn't as easy as it used to be and the results aren't quite the same. Body fat may be harder to lose and muscles harder to gain. Night sweats, belly fat, difficulty hitting intensities are all too common as well. The loss of the hormone balance is screwing signals to the brain and creating metabolic chaos. It's never too late to step in, but taking action early during the pre-menopause can really have profound effects. Getting tested to see if you've reached the menopause, but well, it's difficult. A hormone blood test for estrogen and progesterone on Tuesday might tell you one thing, and on Friday, might tell you something completely different. To get a better idea, what Stacey recommends you get a follicle stimulation hormone test or an FSH. FSH help control your menstrual cycle and stimulate egg growth fairly regular and it is fairly reliable as an indicator. When it has been consistently elevated, it is generally considered that menopause has been reached. You can also have an, an AMH level test. Low levels tend to mean that menopause is imminent and all three tests can really give you a wider image of what is going on in your body. Regardless, a comprehensive panel test of your iron levels, VIT-D, blood sugar levels, cholesterol, triglyceride levels, which is a protein to help measure inflammation, and a thyroid panel. This is all well worth doing so you can see where you really need to take action. Looking at the menopause itself, hormonally speaking, this is now your new biological state. What about the post-menopause? Well, you don't suddenly stop producing estrogen as you have three main types. Esterone, which is E1, estradiol, I think I pronounced that right, which is E2, and estriol. E3. E2 is the main female hormone produced during the reproductive life and it flatlines during the menopause and it is the main cause of all your postmenopausal issues. E3 is produced during pregnancy, otherwise it is barely detectable, and E1 is generated by fat tissues. I'm going to take a stab at the dark, but that's probably why larger men tend to have man boobs. It's because they're producing a lot of E1. E1 is a lot weaker and excess amounts have been linked to vasomotive symptoms like hot flashes, sweating and hot palpitations. I'm unsure to be honest if E1 is the cause of this or it's just correlated to the change in body composition, i.e. does having a higher body fat cause this or is it the E1 that is causing this because both are going to be higher. Either way, losing visceral fat can help and a study of 17,473 women found that a 10 pound drop in body weight greatly reduced or completely eliminated these symptoms. What about race? Studies have found that the average black and Hispanic women, well, they tend to reach menopause at about the age of 49. Black women tend to have a longer transition period and appear to have longer periods of irregular bleeding. The shortest duration of menopause related hot flashes and night sweats, well, this has been found in Japanese women at 4.8 years. Chinese Americans, 5.4 non-Hispanic white women 6.5, Hispanic women 8.9 years, and black women, while well, this can be a whole decade. Weight is also a factor and leaner women experience symptoms for a shorter duration of time. This could all be down to genes, diet, lifestyle, and cultural expectations, as well as general stresses placed on women in different circumstances. Soy could be helping women in Asian countries as they tend to have an elevated amount of soy in their diet, but the results are mixed in studies as to whether it is actually a benefit. And some studies actually show the inverse effect on white White women. It could just be a chicken and egg situation. People tend to suggest soy for ladies with bad symptoms, so those eating more soy tend to be actually those with bad symptoms anyway. Genetics could be playing a part as Asian women are more likely to have the bacteria in their gut to really help them metabolize soy in a favorable way. Now, looking at body composition. Body composition changes mostly in the final three to four years of peri and then flatten out after that. Your percentage of lean muscle begins to decline and your body fat percentage increases. Further changes are more age related, but it doesn't mean you can't do anything about these changes. This is driven by a decrease in insulin sensitivity, leading to increased blood sugar levels and an insulin resistance, which triggers your liver to store fat. Cortisol from excess estrogen, and this equates to abdominal fat. On the flip side, you become less anabolic, which reduces your lean mass. There is a decrease in bone turnover. There's also a decrease in bone turnover. So you're losing bone mineral density. Your weight may not change dramatically, but that's not factoring in what I've just said. There's definitely stuff you can do peri and post menopause to put the brakes on these changes though. And I'll cover that later. Let's talk about estrogen in itself. It is the headliner. As said, there are two main things happening here. E2 is tapering off, leaving an important work being undone. And E2 is is declining at a very different rate, progesterone. Even though both are falling, E2 is falling quicker, so there is an imbalance. E2 is the anabolic hormone, and this helps create lean muscle. And it also helps promote muscle contractions to help generate force. It supports mitochondrial functions, which turn fuel into energy 
because mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Aerobic exercise relies on all these little things. Furthermore, when you're using oxygen to burn fat and produce energy, you get reactive oxygen species or RRS. RRS can damage healthy cells. The body produces antioxidants to quench the RRSs so you can recover. E2 is instrumental for this process to happen. Hence, we need to adjust training and nutrition to replace the work being undone by a lack of E2. Gestrone is anti-inflammatory whilst estrogen, depending if E1 or E2, and the situation is inflammatory. Hence, having high E1 and low E2 in progesterone well, this causes inflammation. This equates to sore joints, impaired gut performance, and also fluid retention. Inflammation increases levels of hepicide, which regulates iron metabolism. High hepicide equals low iron, which equals fatigue. Blood sugar, as already said, is affected too. As well as all the insulin stuff, E2 regulates UT4 activity which pulls glucose into cells without the need of insulin. Lower E2 makes it harder to use starches and blood sugars effectively. The result, well, fat storage as the blood sugar is being pulled into fat cells to get it out of circulation. The good news is though, menopause is not a risk factor for diabetes. You're not more likely to become diabetic, but managing blood sugar and energy, well, that's essential for performance and to help maintain a healthy weight. Oh, and E2 is also a hunger regulator by acting like and also promoting leptin, which is a hormone to blunt your appetite. It also reduces ghrelin, which is the hunger hormone. So guess what happens when you have reduced E2? Estrogen also helps manage mood swings as it increases serotonin, prevents breakdowns, and also increases the density and activity of the receptors of serotonin. The lowering of serotonin creates these erratic mood swings. Moreover, estrogen controls cortisol, the stress hormone. So there's no point for guessing what lower estrogen does. E2 is also needed to regulate core temperatures by managing blood flow to the skin and sweating. You start to lose that consistent control and the brain overcompensates by widening your blood vessels near the skin, head, face, neck and chest and also releases fluids, i.e. hot flushes and sweats. Intervention is possible and will be detailed later. Just quickly, beta alanine helps blood vessels open before exercise. Also, pre-cooling by having a cold drink to help create a heat sink in your stomach and by draping a cold bandana around your neck, well, these can all help alleviate symptoms. E2 also helps regulate nitric oxide a compound in your body that expands blood vessels. A reduction in dilation and constriction of blood vessels means a sudden change of temperature, and this can throw your blood pressure out of sync. Changes in blood pressure can lead to fainting and much more serious things like heart attacks. It continues, E2 helps absorb calcium and decreases the amount lost in urine. It is also key to bone turnover and density. One dimensional stresses like running or cycling but they don't make up for this. And you need to kind of change your exercises to help add in plyometrics. They are far more two-dimensional, well, three-dimensional. Finally, E2 stimulates tissue growth, which in turn helps maintain the thickness of the vaginal line. This helps keep your vagina moist. This is why lots of women experience vaginal dryness and or irritation. Okay, enough about estrogen. Let's talk more about progesterone. This decreases due to less eggs being released, which causes further hormonal complications. This drops at a quicker rate than estrogen, so the ratios really do matter. You'll have excess estrogen to progesterone now. Having a higher level of estrogen compared to progesterone can really loosen your tendons and ligaments, creating instability. Progesterone normalizes this by creating tension in the connective tissues, so the counterbalance leaves you more open to ligament damage, like an ACL tear. Hence, mobilization exercises are really key during this time. It is great for grey matter and is sometimes referred to as the neurosteroid. It calms and reduces the effect of anxiety on the brain and this all helps memory function. Mood swings, memory loss, brain fog and fuzzy headaches can really be attributed to a drop in progesterone. Progesterone also decreases the rate of bone reabsorption and reduces calcium lost in urine. Now mix that with the effects of E2 as said earlier and well, it's not great. This hormone also helps. This hormone also helps to automate nervous system effects on the cardiac vaginal tone. Vaginal or vaginal? I'm gonna go vaginal tone. This is a good indicator of how relaxed you are after a stress. HRV is a favor measure and can be tracked with devices like a whoop band. HRV is the result of the branches in your autonomic nervous system controlling 
fight or flight or relaxed responses. It is basically the time between heartbeats. HRV increasing, HRV increasing means your body is more likely to be resilient to stress. It's complex for women in the menopause due to its effect by elevated anxiety. So tracking recovery using HRV trackers on women during her transition is not great as the algorithm shockingly is based on normal cycling women, not peri or post menopausal ones. To increase HRV to help the rest of responses, one needs to change their lifestyle. Progesterone also increases core body temperature. As it drops, so does the temperature to become more like a man's. This can contribute to weight gain and the changing signals can result in hot flushes and sweats. Spicy foods, caffeine, hot baths, hot weather, and red meats, well, they can all trigger hot flashes. Okay, there's been a lot of negatives and downsides, so let's talk more about the actual interventions. Firstly, we'll consider menopausal hormone therapy, or, or MHT. Again, I'm not telling you what to do here, I'm just delivering the facts based on what someone more qualified than myself has said. MHT is therapy and not a replacement, which some may actually suggest. MHT is more like an oral contraceptive pill, which is a synthetic hormone that mimics some of the fluctuations that natural hormones do. In the early 2000s, research was published published scaring a woman away from MHT 20 years later and the effect is still being felt. In short, the study is linked to extended use of MHT to an increase in chances of breast cancer, heart disease and strokes. The, the studies though, they were not representative of women going through the menopause. The average age of women used was 63 and expanded all the way up to 79. There were also sedentary women and tended not to be of a healthy weight. The study was to see if taking MHT later had an effect on things like osteoporosis. Later reviews have concluded MHT can be used safely by women if they start in that 10 year window surrounding the menopause. A more recent study on peri or ladies on the early onset of menopause who were somewhat leaner found that longer term use can also increase your chances of breast cancer. But the risk of breast cancer dramatically dropped once she came off it. MHT has come a long way also since the early 2000s and is available in a lot lower doses and in different formulations. Transidermal or estrogen may also lower your risk more so than oral hormones. If you still have a uterus, a doctor is more likely to prescribe you progesterone and estrogen. If not, you're more likely to have estrogen only. Estrogen can come in gels, patches of pills, and creams and rings suppositories can really help with vaginal dryness. This all means that MHT can be tailored to your needs and makes the treatment far, far safer. In 2014, a study concluded that therapy had more benefits than risks and helped control symptoms, prevent bone loss, fractures, and improve metabolic health in women under 60 and within that 10 years of a woman's final period. The key is to start younger than 60 and within the 10 year window. Benefits have also been found in alleviating hot flashes and night sweats. Estrogen can help with vaginal dryness if in local form, mood swings, brain fog, anxiety, depression, anger, and sleep issues. Though research is ongoing here. It isn't great for preserving lean mass and reducing fat gain, but it can help with bone health. Talk to your doctor to see which MHT is gonna be best for you and the safest way for you to take it. They can monitor your risk factors and help you guide to see what is best for you. Let's talk quickly about bioidentical hormones. There are so many warnings in this book about regulation and their effectiveness and they can literally just be bought on Amazon. With many, many other things you can do, I'd personally stay clear of these. Okay, adaptogens. Plants can help alleviate the worrisome side effects. They all have different effects, so it's most important to link what you need to the right adaptogen. Start with the most severe symptom first, and after two, three weeks, you can then add a second to try and alleviate something else. It can be safely used in unison, but it's all about kind of dosages, which I'll try and lay out for you. Firstly, Ashwagandha, I think I pronounced that right. It decreases your, whew, I'm going to say DHA, Google it, testosterone, thereby reducing cortisol and lowering anxiety and depression. It is a relaxant, rela is a it is a it is a relaxant, it is a relaxant. I can't get that word up, but kind of in an energizing way. A 2019 study found that taking 250 to 600 milligrams a day for eight weeks significantly reduced serum cortisol stress levels whilst improving your sleep quality. Other studies have found benefits by taking only 240 milligrams a day in adults 
struggling with just stress. Ashwagandha could also be helping regulate blood lipids and also causing the effect and could also be reducing cholesterol. It can also support your thyroid, which is great as the menopause really reduces as the menopause lowers levels of the thyroid hormone. It can be helping with hot flashes too, as an anti-inflammatory may also be reducing the effects of DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. As it also levels cortisol, it can help with insulin sensitivity and this maintains a really good body composition and reduces abdominal fat. So what doses do you need? Start with less and then up it if you need to. I'd say probably start with 300 milligrams twice a day. And this is gonna help with composition, symptoms and glucose control. For stress reduction and anti-inflammatory benefits, you probably only want to start with about 250 per day. Look for supplements with aneloids, which is five to eight percent concentration. Caution with this one is it affects the T3 and T4 thyroid hormone. So if you're on thyroid medication, leave this one. Or if you're a male with family history of prostate cancer. So that was ashwagandha. Let's talk about holy basil. Properly used, it can combat stress, improve blood sugar control, and also acts as an antioxidant, as well as also reducing depression, anxiety, and helping with poor sleep. It is actually so good for metabolic health. A review of 24 studies concluded it is effective for lifestyle-related diseases like diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and physiological stress. So what do we need for dose for this one? Start with 500 milligrams a day. If you want to pair this with ashwagandha, then start with holy basil three weeks and add ashwagandha if needed. Caution with this one is it reduces your blood clotting capacity. Do not use if you are on anticoagulants. Coagulants. I'm not sure I'm gonna pronounce this one right, but ro rhodiola rosa. Think. This helps stimulate balance levels, the neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, and these can be thrown off as stated before. This adaptogen can help improve concentration and reduce mental fatigue, decrease anxiety, and reduce severity of hot flashes. Effects with this one can be very quick. What dose do we need? 150 to 600 milligrams a day. Start at the lower end and up it if you need to. Caution with this one. Best to take it early in the day as it is a stimulant. So if you take it later in the day, it might keep you up. It could also lower blood pressure. Bad for people with already low blood pressure. Also do not take it if you're on immunosuppressants or prescriptions with MAIOs in, which are a form of antidepressant. It could also have such an estrogenic effect. It is wise to leave if estrogen is a contraindicated for you. These don't get any easier to pronounce. So, Scusandra, it stimulates your central nervous system, improves cognition, and also balances your neurotransmitters, like, as we said before, serotonin and dopamine. It also improves energy levels and can alleviate brain fog. In 2016, a study of women between 40 and 70 who suffered from low mood, insomnia, palpitations, hot flashes, and sweats had a significant improvement, especially for those latter three. It can also help strengthen mitochondria as well as muscle strength. What doses for this one? 500 milligrams all the way up to two grams a day if in extract, or 1.5 grams to six grams if it's in the crude form. Caution with this one, is avoid it late in the afternoon due to its caffeine effect, or caffeine-like effect. Now, maca. It is an anti-inflammatory, regulates thyroid function, and also works as a steroid hormone. It is considered the best all in one. When used in early peri, it can be good as an MHT, hot flashes and night sweats. It's also been really popular in athletes for years, as apparently it can help with muscle growth and endurance. Research is yet to have its say on that one though. Dosage, two grams a day for vasomotor and hormone symptoms, 3.5 grams for mood and psychological benefits. Caution, do not use if you're on firearm medication. Some products with maca are actually banned by WADA, the World Anti-Dopancy Agency. So be careful and make sure it's got the informed sport logo. So overall, most people start with ashwagandha. Purity is the priority when looking at any adaptogen. Look for a reputable and organic source. Use any for six weeks, then take a few days break. After that, you can shorten the cycle to three weeks on, two days off. This prevents a buildup of a tolerance. Take any adaptogen in any form you like. A lot of people have like it in powdered form and putting it in their drink. They can be used to preempt symptoms. They can be used to, to preempt symptoms and are beneficial for all genders and age. One caveat is with MHTs. If you're still experiencing symptoms with an MHT, question the MHT rather than adding adaptogens. If you want to come off an MHT, work with your doctor to taper off it. Heavy lifting. If you take nothing else from this video, then just take that you should be really heavy lifting. And we are talking compound lifts. So squats, bench press, deadlifts, all of those 
great stuff. Everybody loses muscle mass over time. If you do nothing about it, you will lose about 8% a decade after the age of 30. And that increases even more when you've hit 60. So why lift heavy? Over light. Building true strength is a matter of increasing the maximum force a muscle could produce in a single contraction. To improve this, it is best to lift heavy. Ice cream bar. You'll really get those nerves firing and establishing neuromuscular connections. It is also improves metabolic rate due to the higher active muscle tissue, improves posture and stability. It helps remodeling your bones and improves bone mineral density, improving cardiovascular health and also bettering your blood pressure. It maintains lean muscle mass and reduces fat gain. What more do you want? The effects of heavy lifting are far greater than any endurance-based lifting, even in endurance athletes. For tips of getting any help with heavy lifting, reach out to me and I'm more than happy to help or if you know someone, that's fantastic. Alongside lifting, Kegel activities involve a clenching and relaxation of the pelvic floor are also great too if you suffer from peeing yourself. Six to 10 deep breaths in the child's yoga pose daily for six weeks has been shown to have a great effect of reducing this too. At this point in life, you need to lift all year and not just in the off season. Ideally lifting twice a week in season and three times out of season. That's heavy lifting. Now let's talk about plyometrics. In 2019, a systematic review of recent literature found 58 to 79 year olds reported improved muscular strength, bone health, body composition, posture, and physical performance when they started plyometrics. None found an increase of injury or any other adverse effects. Running is not enough and we need multi-directional forces to absolutely reap the benefits. As said, Oestrogen is anabolic. Without the stimulus, you need something else. Plyometrics can wake up the otherwise quiet genes inside your muscles to stimulate those cells to improve muscle power and composition. It also maintains, builds and improves the function of mitochondria. This means you will have more fuel available, improving endurance. Oh, and it also improves insulin in sensitivity, so you can get that glucose into your cells more properly. Plus, it was found that jumping 10 to 20 times a day can significantly improve your bone density after 16 weeks. Even more if you're doing 20 jumps twice a day and it is far more than just running alone. Just 10 minutes three times a week can really make you have some decent gains. It is great to do after strength training. Simple movements like squat jumps, jumping jacks, tuck jumps, and side jumps are all you need really. Even if you have an injury, you could actually really benefit from doing this in water. Try doing it in the shallow end of a swimming pool. Let's talk about your gut health. Microbes in your guts were once thought to only help digestion and nutrient absorption, but we now know that's not true. They also have benefits for many other things and that includes brain function. When you eat, you feed the microbiome first. When you have a diverse and balanced microbiome, you have good health and performance. It can affect sleep quality too by increasing the amount of REM sleep that you have. 90% of microbiome are one of two types. You've got your firmicutes, which are your sugar lovers, which send signals to your brain to have more sugar. So an abundance can cause fat and also inflammatory issues. And then there's bacteriodetes and they block inflammation and raise metabolism. The latter absorbs less energy from your food, meaning you're less likely to gain weight. It's not just calories in, calories out that matter. Best way to get the right balance of these two is what you're eating and when you're eating it. Firstly, Aim for whole food diets and with plenty of fruit and veg. Eating fibrous foods, especially plants, increases the diversity of your microbiome. Aim for 25 grams of fiber from plants a day. Top tier foods for the balance are berries, nuts, seeds, beans, tea, coffee, olive oil, and veg. Thank God coffee is on there. Probiotics from preventive foods like yogurt, kefir, sauerkraut, kombucha, and tempeh are fab. Avoid yogurts with added probiotics in though. They tend to be weighted heavily to one strain over another, and that's gonna cause an imbalance. Excellent prebiotics to help keep those bacteria thriving are garlic, onions, leeks, asparagus, green bananas, and Jerusalem artichokes. You don't want to be taking supplements. They can contain a lot of one thing and not so much of another. We also don't know the long-term effects of taking supplements is, and it could really cause a backlash. The only time they could actually be useful is when you're taking antibiotics or other medication which could be destroying your gut flora. Go easy on the processed foods too and refined carbs. Research shows that they're really bad for your gut flora too. Hydrating with low carb sports drinks can help promote gut microbiome from the harmful effects of too much sugar. 
Look for products without artificial sweeteners as they can aggravate the gut. Artificial sweeteners, antibiotics, processed foods have all been linked to poor gut microbiome. Damn it, I do love a Pepsi Max. There's loads more in the book, Next Level by Stacey Sims, so I urge you to read it for yourself.